Praise the Lord. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Father, we thank you for the Bible study. Thank you for granting our journey mercies and all the others who have gone to the Bible study in the various locations. Lord, we pray you will reach our lives in your word today in Jesus' name. Let's see, Lord, the deep things and the mysteries you have in your word for everyone. That you'll touch our hearts, you'll warm our hearts, you'll enlighten our hearts, so that, Lord, we'll run with the message you're giving unto us. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. We're coming back to our Bible study in 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. And we're looking at verses 9, 10, and 11. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy where we were joy were a joys for your sakes. Before our God, night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect, fulfill, complete that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. As we have been studying the epistle of Paul to the Thessalonians, we have noticed that God used Paul and Silas and Timothy to plant that vibrant church, although a little church in Thessalonica. After planting the church, persecution arose. And because of that, those great men of God, Paul, Silas, and Timothy, they were driven out of the city, out of the town. And then for a long time, they wanted to go back. And they were not able to go back. You look at chapter 2, verse 18. It says, Wherefore we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, but... He said once again, but Satan hindered us. He said, Thessalonian believers, since we left, and since we were taken away sharply, seriously from you, we wanted to come back. And in particular, myself, Paul the Apostle, I wanted to come back to you once and again, which means it tried once, it failed, and tried again, it failed, tried again, it failed. And he gave the reason, he said, because Satan hindered us. And it's been having this mind now. What do we do? Because they need some teaching. They need some encouragement. They need some. They need some kind of moving on. And because of that, that's why he said in verse 5 of chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 5. For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, that is forbear staying away. And forbear being absent. And forbear not being in contact with you. When I could no longer forbear or stand that, I sent to know your faith. Lest by some means the tempter have tempted you, and our labor be in vain. Now you're going to look at something there. You're going to look at that thing in verse 5. It says, for this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent. I sent. Very important. As you look at the ministry of Paul the Apostle, in fact, all the other apostles too, you look at their ministry, they wanted to encourage the believers, empower the believers, equip the believers, mature the believers, complete the faith, perfect the faith of the believers, and make the children of God strong and vibrant in the faith. If they were not able to do that directly, what they did was they sent other people, other preachers, other pastors, other overseers to help those people. I want to follow through on that in verse 5 where it says, For this cause, when I could no longer forbear, I sent to know your faith. And then you look at verse 6, it says, But now when Timotheus came from you unto us, he had sent Timothy to them. And then Timothy came back and Timothy said, that church is standing. That church is faithful. That church is holy and righteous. That church is stable and steadfast. And because of that, he wrote to them. You see the points, number one, he sent. He sent Timothy. Number two, Timothy came back. And when Timothy gave that report, he sent this epistle to them. That's why he said in chapter 5, verse 27, 
I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. I've got a good report about you that you are saved, you are righteous, you are holy, you are following after the Lord. And I'm writing to you to encourage you and establish and equip you because of that. I want this epistle to be read unto everyone in the fellowship. But let, let's look at this, the fact that he's saint. He saint Timothy, when he couldn't go there, look at 1 Corinthians chapter 4. 1 Corinthians chapter 4, we're reading from verse 16 and verse 17. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. He was writing to the Corinthian believers, the Lord had used him too to establish the church in Corinth. And it wasn't with them now, but now he's going to send somebody and he's going to tell them, you need to be followers of me. What I believe, you believe. Where I stand, you stand. The persecution I endure, you are going to endure. And then he said in verse 17, for this cause, so that you'll know what to do. You'll know the pattern to follow. You'll know the example to follow. you know the life to live because of this, for this cause, I have sent unto you Timotheus, who is my be beloved son, and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. He said, I'm sending Timothy to you. I thought you said you sent him to Tesnaika, yes? I'm sending him to different places. He came back from that. I sent him to another place again. Look at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12, sending them out so that they can do the follow-up. Sending them out so they can establish and encourage the believers. Chapter 12, I'm reading there from verse 17. Did I make a gain of you by any, by any of them whom I sent unto you? You see the pattern in the New Testament that if the apostle was not able to go somewhere, what he did was he looked at some faithful people. He looked at some capable people. He looked at some equipped hands and trained hands and he will send them. Verse, verse 18, I desire Titus and will see my saint a brother. The Titus make a gain of you. Walked we not in the same spirit? Walked we not in the same steps? He said, all these people I'm sending out, I know that they will walk in the same step, will preach the same thing, will believe the same doctrine. They will do exactly what I would have done if I came there. Verse 19 again, think ye that we excuse ourselves unto you, will speak before God in Christ, but will do all things Dearly beloved, for your edifying. The people you sent to those places, they did everything and said everything and taught everything for the edification of those believers. It's telling us something about the people that are sent out. A region of CM is sent out some pastors of the local government to go and help some local government churches. And then the state of Asia is sent out some region of Asia and other pastors and group coordinators to go and help. Some of the churches should have gone and is not able to go there. What do they do when they go there? They equip the people, admonish the people, establish the people, edify the people and build the people up. Ephesians chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 21. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21. But that ye also may know my affairs and how I do. Tychicus, a beloved brother and faithful minister in the Lord, shall make known to you all things whom I have sent unto you for this, for the same purpose. He said, there's another one, Tychicus, I'm sending him out to you in Ephesus. You see, what we're saying is that the leadership, sometimes they pick out a good leader, a useful leader, a profitable leader, and send him out to another place to go and establish the church over there in that state, establish the church over there in that region, establish the church over there in that local government. It's a Bible pattern. It's a New Testament pattern. And that is how to make use of the servants of God, of the ministers of the gospel, to help every area of the world. Verse 22, whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose, that ye might know my, our fears, and that he might comfort your hearts, comfort them, encourage them. Philippians chapter 2. 
verse 25. Philippians chapter 2, verse 25. Yet I suppose it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and companion in labor. Here Paul, the apostle, is speaking on another person. And this one is Epaphroditus. He said, Philippians, I'm sending this one to you. Why don't you send Timothy to us? No, you don't have a choice. I'm sending this one, Epaphroditus, unto you. He's my companion in labor. He is a fellow preacher, fellow laborer a faithful man to you and he said a brother a companion labor a fellow soldier but your messenger and he that ministered to my wants don't you need him of course i need him but for selfless service because you need him too so that he can strengthen your faith i'm sending him unto you verse 28 i sent him therefore the more carefully that when you see him, he may rejoice that I may and that I may be less sorrowful. We're looking at Colossians chapter 4, verse 7. Colossians chapter 4. We're looking at verse 7 there. All my stay shall take a course, declare unto you, who is a beloved brother and a faithful minister and fellow servant in the Lord. The people who are sent out like that, they are not people that, you know, are wobbling, the people who are compromising, the people who are prayerless, the people who cannot live the life that is straightforward. The people who are dependable, people who are trustworthy, people who are faithful, and people who can be trusted even when they apostle was not there. He said, I'm sending this one to you. He is Taiki cause and he's a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord. Look at verse 8. Whom I have sent unto you for the same purpose that he, that he might know you. He might know your state, estate and comfort your heart. Was Paul the apostle peculiar in this? Was he only the one? And he only the apostle that was sending out people whenever I was not able to go somewhere? No, not at all. I want you to read Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. Acts of the Apostles chapter 8. I'm reading from verses 14 and 15. The apostles in Jerusalem, that's exactly what they did. Whenever there was revival somewhere, the work of God needing a helping hand somewhere, They'll send some of the capable people, some of the experienced people, some of the people that were capable and competent, and they send those people unto them. Acts chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 14. Now, when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John. You see that? Peter and John, those were pillars in the Jerusalem church. And even though there were pillars in Jerusalem church, revival broke out in Samaria. And he said, it's Philip cannot do all the work all by himself. That's telling us something. You were not even sending people only to the place where there's no pastor. There's no overseer. In some places, there are evangelists, capable, competent evangelists like Philip. And yet, Philip needs a helping hand. And therefore, we send some people to Philip, to Samaria, so as to go and help the work over there. Verse 15, who when they were come down, they prayed, prayed for him, for them, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. I'm looking at chapter 11. Chapter 11, I'm reading all this to you so that you will know it's not just a once in a while scene. It was something common in the early church that the apostles were sent out capable hands, capable laborers, and capable officials of men to go and evangelize and to go and edify the people, mature the believers, so that those believers, new converts, they'll be standing and they'll be steadfast in the things of the Lord. Acts chapter 11 from verse 22. Acts chapter 11 verse 22. Then the tidings of these things came unto the ears of the church which was in Jerusalem and is saying forth Barnabas that he should go as far as Antioch. You remember that Barnabas was referred to as the son of consolation, a beloved brother indeed in the Jerusalem church and when they had that some other far distant regions and places needed a helping hand, a preaching man, 
a revivalist, somebody that will be able to go there and lift up their faith, encourage their faith, perfect their faith. What did they do? They sent Barnabas, the son of consolation, unto that place, and they told him, go as far as Antioch, who when he came and had seen the grace of God, he was glad, and he exhorted them all that with purpose of heart, they would cleave unto the Lord, for he was a good man. The people they sent out are good people. Righteous people, safe people, the people that know the Lord, not the people who are falling and rising, not the people who are not sure of the doctrines of the Bible, but the people that were good in the sight of the Lord and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And much people was added unto the Lord. When these people got there, they actually did real great evangelistic work as well as pastoral work that the church became matured. That's why Paul the Apostle sent out Timothy because he wasn't able to go to Thessalonica. We're coming back now to 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, we're looking at verse 6. But now, when Timotheus came from you unto us, Timothy came back unto Paul to give a report of what he saw and what he felt and the fellowship that he saw in the midst of the people. He spoke about their faith, he spoke about their love, he spoke about their faith in the Lord, and he spoke about their hope. He spoke about their soul winning system that those people, the word of the Lord, went from them, from that Thessalonica on to Macedonia and Achaia, and those people were mighty soul winners. And he told Paul the Apostle of the dynamic life of fellowship that those people had. That's why Paul. Paul the apostle said in verse 6, But now when Timotheus came from you unto us, and he brought us good tidings of your faith and your charity, that's your love, and that ye have good remembrance of us, always desiring greatly to see us as we also to see you. Therefore, brethren, we were comforted over you in all our afflictions and distress by your faith. And now he began, he began to praise the Lord for them. Look at it in verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God again for you for all the all the joy wherewith wherewith we join for your sakes before our God night and day praying night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith and the prayer continue now now God Himself and our, our Father and Lord Jesus Christ will direct our way unto you. He's saying, yes, I know that Timothy did a good job there, but I'm still planning that I will come myself. As we look at the study today, praying for the greatest need of believers, or praying for the greatest need of the church, as we look at these apostolic prayers and pastoral visits in the New Testament, we see much instruction. The ministers of the gospel and members of churches today have a lot to learn from all these. And Paul in particular and his fellow laborers, the way they visited the churches, what did they do when they went? Number one, they confirmed the souls of the disciples in the faith. Number two, what did they do? Is to see how they do. It's not just to preach, interact with them, fellowship with them, look at their lives and, and see their fellowship and see what they're doing and see what they have and see what they don't have so that they'll be able to supply what was missing in their Christian lives. Number three, it was to strengthen and to establish the churches in the faith. Number four, it was to reaffirm and declare the whole counsel of God unto them. They were good on salvation. That's great. There's, there's still more. They were good on evangelism. There is more. There, there's still more than that. And they were good in a faith that is able to hold on to the Lord and stand in persecution. There's still more to face than that. And they were very good in waiting for the coming of the Lord according to chapter 1 verse 10. But there's still more than that. That's why he's saying that we're coming back to you. And when we get to you, we're going to perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Not only that, number five, it was to impart some spiritual gift for the establishment of the church. Number six, to search in order all things concerning their worship and concerning their relationships. Relationships in marriage, 
Relationships in business, relationship between brother and sister, between sister and sister, and between brother and brother, and between the Christian and the unbelievers, their neighbors, to settle everything and set everything in order. Number seven, to bring back those who have fallen from grace from Christ. Those who have fallen from grace, to bring them back then. Number eight, to perfect whatever was lacking in the believer's faith and ministries. You find then that the pastoral prayers and intercession for the church in the New Testament call us to re-examine our prayers for the church and our prayers in the church. As we look at the prayers most of the churches pray today, maybe our church included you. The prayers and the petitions are puny. That means they are small. That means they are weak. That means they're insignificant. If you compare the prayers of the New Testament to the prayers of the church today, you'll find that the prayers today is like we're asking only for the body. When we could be asking for the soul, we're asking only for temporal things. One should be asking for spiritual, eternal things. We're only asking for pennies. One should be asking for the purity of the church and power of the Lord in the church. Many people are asking for arms when they could be asking for the arm of the Lord. Not only sufficient for the day, but for sufficient for a lifetime. The apostles were different, and we must repent of our mean and meaningless prayers so that the prayers of the New Testament will change and transform the way we pray, the way we pray for ourselves, the way we pray for our families, the way we pray for our local church, the way we pray for the church in general. And I pray that what the Lord is teaching us today will impact our lives and transform every area of our lives in Jesus name. As we look at the study today, talking about praying for the greatest need of believers and of the church, I look at point number one, continual praises for the preservation through his power. Paul the Apostle, full of praises to the Lord. In fact, almost everywhere he's saying, I praise God for you, I praise God for you, I praise God for you. And then he will mention what was praising the Lord for, what happened to the Thessalonian believers, their lives, their families, their faith, their love, their hope, their steadfastness and their stability in the faith. He praised the Lord for them. I want you to look at chapter 3, verse 9. Chapter 3, verse 9. For what thanks can we render to God again for you? For all the joy wherewith we joy for your sakes before our God. Paul the apostle said, I'm praising God for you. Uh, have you found people that always, I praise God, I praise God, I praise God. And then you ask them, hey, my friend, what are you praising God for? They don't know. They say, um, 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 well, we just praise God. If you're praising God, you must be praising God for something. When Timothy came back from Thessalonica, he, he began to tell uh, Paul the Apostle the report about those people. And the report he gave Paul the Apostle made him to praise the Lord. What did he praise God for? Look at you, chapter 1, verse 2. Chapter 1, verse 2. We give thanks to God always for you all making mention of you in our prayers. Why? Look at verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith, your labor of love, and your patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God and our Father. He said, Thessalonian believers, you know why we're praising God for you? We're praising God because I remember your work of faith. Timothy told me about that. I remember your labor of love. Timothy told me about that. And I remember your patience of hope. And Timothy told me about that because of that I'm praising God for you. Look at chapter 1 verse 6. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord. We were not there. We gave you the word. You saw the pattern of our lives. And I'm told that since we led, you patterned your life after the life we showed you as a Christian life. Because of that, we are praising the Lord. Look at verse 7. It says in verse 7, so that you are examples to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. He said, that's why I'm praising God for you. You became examples and you became patterns. You are not just converts. You became light shining and the salt of the earth. And because of that, I'm praising God. Look at verse 8. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith toward God, to God's word, 
is spread abroad. He said, I'm also praising God because you're a soul winning church. Look at chapter 2, verse 20. Chapter 2, verse 20. For ye are our joy, our glory, and our joy. Every time we just remember, we wish every church, every local church will be like your church in Thessalonica. And because of it gladdens our heart and it gives us joy, we even forget why we're looking at you and looking at your growth and looking at your excitement and your growth in the Lord. We forget our affliction and you become our joy, our happiness, and the source of our gladness. He said, that is why we're praising God for you. Look at chapter 3, verse 6. It says, And now when Timotheus came from you unto us and brought us good tidings of your faith, because of the good news that came from Thessalonica, everybody talking about them, good news, no bad news. It didn't say that one backslid, that one committed adultery, that one stole. That one's having a court, a, a case in the court. That one beat his wife. That one, you know, did something. That one committed abortion. No bad news at all. Good news every time coming from Thessalonica because of the good news he said. That's why we're praising God for you. I pray that we'll be able to praise God for you. No bad news of backsliding. No bad news of committing sin. No bad news of duping anybody, but good news, good news of living a righteous life. That's why Paul, the apostle, praised the Lord for them. Look at chapter 4, verse 9. In chapter 4, verse 9, but as touching brotherly love, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, verse 10, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. He said, Timothy has told me a lot about you. He saw the love flowing. No kind of animosity and no hatred and no malice, no infighting. Timothy told me when he came back from you, Testaments, that he didn't have to sit down counseling people. You have to forgive now. Why don't you forgive? No, I will never forgive him until we get to, to the great beyond. And because this is what he did. Timothy told me that there is no rancor, there is no conflict, there is no confusion, and uh, there is no battle, there is no infighting among you. He just told me that your love is flowing one to the other. And he said, that's, that's the reason why I'm praising God for you Thessalonian believers. And when the Lord can see that same thing about us, from the leaders to the members and from the members to one another and from the tenants to the tenant the co-tenants those who are living in the same place and there's nothing that you know we're settling quarrel there's hatred there's animosity there's fighting against one another and it's all love of course we'll praise god for such a fellowship and for such a church and that's why paul the apostle said i'm praising god for you look at chapter 5 and verse 11 chapter 5 verse 11 Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. He said, it's like I shouldn't even say that, that you comfort one another because you're doing that already. And that you should edify one another, you're doing that already. And that's the reason he was praising God for them. He said, I'm praising God for you because of the comfort, the joy. When somebody is sick, there's somebody there visiting him. When the other fellow has lost somebody in the family, there's another one that is staying and sleeping, even in that house to comfort the people that have bereaved. He said because of the love, practical love, daily love, that is uninterrupted among you. That's why I'm praising the Lord for you. Come back to chapter 3 now, verse 9. He says, for what thanks can we render to God again for you? He said, I am short of words. He said, what expression of thanksgiving can we render to God that will be equal or sufficient that to the to the grace of God towards you. He said, it's the sustaining power that is keeping you steady in holy work and obedience in the midst of intense persecution. It makes me to praise God for you. And he said, he knew a, a few months ago before, you were just idol worshippers before dump idols, but now you have turned to God to, to serve the living and the true God who can stop but praise God for you. They were ignorant before, but now they are knowledgeable. 
They were walking in darkness before, but now they were walking in the light. They knew nothing before, but now they knew the word of God. They were in spiritual darkness because their hearts and their minds were blinded, but now their eyes were opened, and they were completely turned from darkness unto the light. That's why I said I'm praising God for you. And when you look at your own Christian life, and say, what change has taken place in my life? What transformation has taken place in my life? What could Apostle Paul, if he were here today, what could he praise God for in my life? And what could our leaders praise God for in your life? That's what you need to consider. So that you will know that by the grace of God, a change has taken place, a transformation has taken place, a turning around has taken place, and then the love is there, the joy is there, the good news is there, and the beautiful, righteous life is there. You are consistently living according to the word of the Lord, and you are following the example and the pattern of the leadership that they have laid down for us. And because of that, your life is something worthy of the praise of God, and because of that, other people, they say, I thank God for brother so-and-so. I thank God for sister so-and-so. Doesn't have any quarrel with anybody, hatred for anybody. Doesn't have any enemy in the church or outside the church. He just lives his life in the love of God, in fellowship. And then everybody praising the Lord for you, for me, for us together. I pray it will be like that in Jesus' name. These were captives of Satan before, but now they were free. They were slaves of sin in the past, but now they had been delivered from the power of sin and Satan. The Jews that had a form of godliness, they failed to attain the righteousness, which is of faith. But these gentle believers, they received and they retained the righteousness and true holiness in spite of their affliction, in spite of their persecution. That's why Paul said, I'm praising God on your behalf. But it wasn't just the Thessalonian believers alone. As you look at the New Testament, you'll see Paul the Apostle and other people to praising God for all the churches. We're looking at Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1, and I'm reading there from verse 8. It says, First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for you all. That's wonderful. He said, I cannot even make an exception. Even the little ones there, I'm thanking God for you. And the newcomers there were thanking God for the teenagers there were thanking God for you. The change that took place, the faith, vibrant faith that came into them and the new life they were living now. That's why Paul the apostle said, I look at you, the church at Rome and I see that there is something that has happened in your life and I'm praising God for you. And he said that your faith is spoken of throughout the whole world. Everybody they were talking about the Roman Christians, the Christians at Rome, they have changed. They have been converted. They have been transformed. They, no more, they are no more following the tradition of the Romans. They are no more following the superstition of the Romans. Those people, their lives have become totally different. Everybody talking about that. And that's why Paul said, I'm hearing the news. I'm hearing everybody is gossiping about you. But it's not a bad gossip. They're saying that you have changed. They say they are trans, you are transformed. And they say you are new creatures in Christ. They're talking about your new face and your new life and your new love and your new outlook. And that gladdens my heart. I'm praising God for you. Look at chapter, chapter 6 of uh, Romans. Romans chapter 6, I'm reading from verse 17. Romans chapter 6, verse 17. But God be sent. You know, he thanked God for them in chapter 1. And then almost before he got to the middle of the epistle again, he said, can I stop thanking God for you? Can I stop praising God for you? The change that has taken place in your life, it makes me rejoice. Verse 17, but God be thanked that she was servants of sin. But ye have obeyed from the heart the form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. He said, which apostle will not be happy because everything I taught you, you received it in your heart and then you practice it and we can see the outcome of your coming to the Bible study. We can see the outcome of listening to the messages on Sunday. We can see the outcome of all those evangelism messages you listen to because you are practicing what you have heard. 
word. It says, it gives me joy. And let the same joy be in the hearts of our leaders concerning you and concerning your children, concerning our, our school children, concerning our youth that we say we're thanking God because everything we're teaching them, they're not following after the world and following after the examples of the people who have not known the faith, but from their heart, they are practicing everything they have learned. And let's look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14. 2 Corinthians chapter 2 verse 14. But now thanks be unto God which always causes us to triumph in Christ. It says thanks be unto God. Corinthian believers have been looking at you since I warned you and chastised you and disciplined you and rebuked you in the first Corinthians. I now come to the second Corinthians and I see there's something to thank God for because now according to this verse 14 the Lord has made you to triumph over the temptations of the past now you are triumphing and over the compromise of the past now you are triumphing because of that I'm praising God for you that's the reason we praise God for anybody that now you are no more compromising now you are no more falling and rising that you are standing upon the faith upon the word of God and that you are steadfast, you are courageous, you have a backbone to your faith, and that your life is according to the teaching of the word of God. If there was any compromise to your life before, and we rebuked you and chastised you and corrected you and disciplined you, then you shaped up and said, Lord, I'm going to stand now, I'm going to be triumphant now, to be more than a conqueror. That's why the apostles said, I'm thanking God for you, because now always the Lord is causing you to triumph, and make it, and make it manifest, the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. I'm looking at Philippians chapter 1. Philippians chapter 1 and I'm reading there from verse 3. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Think about that. That Paul the apostle he was thinking about the Philippian church. You know the Philippian church uh, that is the place where Paul the apostle was silenced. They were put in prison. And when they were put in prison, they began to sing in the night. And while they were singing songs of praises to the Lord, then the prison doors opened and the windows opened. And all the people that were captives and prisoners there, they lost all their bounds. But they were still remaining there. You remember the story that the Philippian jailer came out and he wanted to kill himself. And Paul shouted with a loud voice and said, don't kill yourself. We're all here. And then he took the lamp and he bumped in. He came in there. And then when he saw that, he says, us, what shall I do to be saved? They led him to the Lord and led his household to the Lord. A church began there. And when they saw what they had suffered, and eventually they left Philippi, and then they got information that these Philippian believers, you know what? They were standing in the faith. And they said, we don't even care about our imprisonment, about the suffering we went through, because that suffering had a purpose. You know, when you have gone to evangelize, and then you suffered, maybe they beat you up, maybe they insulted you, maybe they abused you, but then the compass that you won in the midst of that abuse, in the midst of that insult, in the midst of that assault, they were standing. And then Paul, the apostle, got information back concerning the church in Philippi. He said, I'm thanking God for you. You know why? Look at verse 4. Always in every pair of mind for you all making requests of joy. He said, when I pray for you, it's not like I'm praying for the Galatian church and then I'm sorrowful, traveling in bus again because they are forsaken Christ and because they are not going through to circumcision and the Lord Moses said, no, you are different. When I'm praying for the Philippian church, it's all with joy because, look at verse 5, for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now. He said, from the first day that I knew you and you came to the Lord as new converts until this very time, I'm just happy about your following after the Lord, being confident of this very thing in verse 6, that he which had begun, what kind of work? A good work he will perfect it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's the reason why Paul the Apostle said, I just thank God for you. I pray that we'll be able to say the same thing concerning you. Second Thessalonians chapter 1. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm reading there from verse, from verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, looking at verse 3. 
Second Thessalonians chapter 1, looking at verse 3. It says, we're bound to thank God always for you. It's coming back to Thessalonica now because in First Thessalonians, he had praised God for them. In every chapter in, cha in uh, First Thessalonians, he praised God for them because they were standing because they were uncompromising, because they remained in the faith, because of their love, because of their hope, and because of the comfort one to another, because of visitation, evangelism, soul winning, everything that they did. He said, I just thank God for you. Now, he come to Thessalonian believers. Now, this second epistle, you know some people, if you praise them, appreciated them, in the first letter, in the first message, in the first day, they'll say, okay, we're doing fine. We're doing great. Then they relax. Then they go back. Then they lessen their loyalty. Then they lessen their faithfulness. They say, Paul said, we're doing great. Paul said, we're doing fine. And he's praising God for us. And he's thanking God all the time for us. They relax. Not the Thessalonian believers. Even though he praised them, appreciated them in First Thessalonians, when he comes to Second Thessalonians, a few months after, he wrote to them again. He said, who can resist preaching to these people? Who can resist writing to these people? Because they were just growing and growing, going beyond all the bounds that he ever knew. Look at chapter 1 verse 3, but we are bound to thank God. God always for you, brethren, as it is me, because your faith grows exceedingly. He said, in First Thessalonians, I spoke about your faith and how happy I was, how grateful I was that I have you for converts. But then he said, since that time, I see that your faith is growing exceedingly and the charity of every one of you all toward each other abounds. He said, you're not just static. You're not staying in the same place. You're growing. And that's what the Lord wants to see about us when there's something thankworthy in your life. When there's something praiseworthy in your life. And then we say, we praise God for you. We're thanking God for you. That you're stable, you're steadfast, you're equipped, and you're determined to follow after the Lord. Then you don't relax because of that. Then you double your effort. And you increase your effort. Then you increase your commitment. And increase your consecration and say, Praise the Lord. I don't ever want uh, the apostle to hear any bad news because he's been hearing good, good news about me. I want better news to even get to the apostle. That's what they did over there. That's what we're going to do. I said, That's what we're going to do. We'll go from faith to faith in Jesus' name and from strength to strength in Jesus' name so that the thing that will describe our life could be more and more, more and more, not less and less, not decreasing, but increasing. You are going to increase. Look at verse 4. So that we ourselves glory in you in the churches of God for your patience and faith in all your persecutions and tribulations that ye endured. And that's the reason why he was praising God for them. And I pray that we'll be able to praise God for you. Your life will be praiseworthy. When your wife is talking to us about us, how you, you know, my husband has changed. My husband is so radiant now. My husband is so loving. Now, before my husband started coming to this church, you know, I, I can't tell you how I suffered, how I fasted, how I prayed, how I cried. But now everything is peaceful at home. And they will say, Come and show me your husband. I say, This is a good man, the wonderful man. You'll be the wonderful man. And then the man saying, Pastor, if the church didn't do anything for me, at least to transform my wife, now the life of my my wife, you know, so gentle and so nice and so loving and caring for the children. And anytime I have any problem, like if I'm sick or whatever, I come and seek care like I never saw before. I thought nobody could ever care for me like my mother, but this woman has gone beyond what my mother ever did. This is what we're talking about. That then when they talk to us about you, we we'll say, where is that your wife? And it's, that's the good woman there. And then we we'll say, we we'll praise the Lord for you. I pray we'll praise the Lord for you so that your life will be beautiful and your life will be radiant for the glory of God in Jesus name. I come to point number two now. Point number two ceaseless prayers by Paul for these people. These people of God, Thessalonian believers, how Paul the apostle first of all he praised the Lord and second he prayed for them. You see those two things. Number one is the praise and then number two is the prayer. Why? 
since the people are doing good and the people are doing great already and the people are giving us good news and you know, they are saved and they are so winning and they are, you know, they are, living, they are steadfast in the Lord and Paul, the apostle, you have been praising the Lord for them. Why are you praying for them again? And let's look at the reason why we're, we're talking about prayer after praise. Number one, they were saved. But then even though they were saved, there was still something more. They could be sanctified. Not only that, they were pleasing God already. And the Lord wanted them to please him more and more. But they are pleasing God already. That's why we are praising God for them. And then they need to please God more and more. That is the reason why we need to pray. Not only that they loved one another. But the Lord wanted their love to increase and to abound more and more. That's why after the praise, there is praying and then they had faith but the Lord wanted them to have greater faith that's the reason after the praise the raise the prayer I'm looking at 1 Thessalonians chapter chapter 1 chapter 4 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 you see the reason why after praising God for somebody we don't just stop praising God for them then we pray after that because they could be greater than they are, better than they are, and they could go faster, more steadfast than they are. We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter four, verse nine. It says, "But as touching brotherly love, ye need, have, ye need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another, and indeed ye do it. You are doing it already. That's why we are praising God for you, and you do it toward all the brethren which are in Macedonia, but." We beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. It's for the more and more. We're now praying for them. And when you've been doing something great and something good, but there's still the opportunity of growing. There is room for growth. There is room for expansion. And there is room for development. It's a room for growth, for expansion, for development. That's why after the praising God for you, now we pray for you. We're looking at their faith now. We're looking at it in chapter 1. Chapter 1 in verse 3. Remembering without season your work of faith that's why we're praising god but there's still more there's still more because we can move from faith to faith second Thessalonians chapter one verse three we're bound to thank god always for you brethren as it is meet because your faith groweth exceedingly you see that that's the reason why after we say somebody is doing good is doing great is wonderful we don't stop pray, prayer because of that we're praising god for them because they are saved but there's still more. They can be sanctified. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23, and they sanctify you wholly, entirely, completely. And I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved, blameless, unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Even though they were saved, yes, thank God for them. That's why we're praising God for them. Because they were saved. But because there is still sanctification. After that, salvation. That's what we're praying for now. They were pleasing God already, but they need to please God more and more. That's the reason why he prayed for them. What I'm telling you is, or what the Bible is teaching us is, you look at somebody's life and say, this is a real genuine believer. I'm praising God for him. This is really good. You think about his life. You think about her life and say this is beautiful and I'm praising God for him or for her. That doesn't mean that that's final. That means you know what I'm saying. We still pray for them so that what they're doing, the good thing they have, they'll do it more and more. Just like you, the good thing you're doing, you'll do it more and more. And then our praises to God will double on your behalf in Jesus' name. Hey, look at it in chapter 4, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verse 1. Moreover, then we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as ye have received of us, how ye ought to walk and please God, how ye ought to walk and please God, so ye would abound more and more. It's because of that more and more. That's the reason why we're now praying for them. That's why we're at point number two. After the constant praises of the Lord, after this uh, praise of the Lord concerning these uh, believers, the continual praises, now we have the ceaseless prayer by this apostle for the people of God in Thessalonica. Paul's prayer was habitual 
and unceasing, not occasional and spasmodic, because he says, look at that chapter 3, verse 10. He says, night and day praying exceedingly. Night and day praying exceedingly. His prayers were intensely fervent and specific. You know, there are people that pray cold prayers, lethargic prayers. They could almost be sleeping in that prayer. And while they are praying, they go, while they are praying, they go to sleep. And they've gone, they're already dreaming about another thing. Not Paul the Apostle. When Paul prayed, it was fervent. When Paul prayed, it was specific. When Paul prayed, it came out of the heart like almost hot labor of, a, of prayer coming into the ears of the Lord. Cold prayers are like arrows without heads. Cold prayers are like swords without edges. Cold prayers are like birds without wings. Those prayers, they do not pierce anything. Those prayers did not cut anything. Those prayers did not fly to heaven. Cold prayers always freeze before they get to heaven. But the fervency of spirit with righteousness availeth much in prayer. Paul labored much in preaching. He also traveled much in prayer. Paul the apostle, he did God's work both ways. He did God's work, number one, by preaching. Number two, by praying. His preaching and praying demanded and led the church to heights of holiness and glory previously unknown by other Christians. And look at the prayers that he prayed. The prayers that he prayed for the churches. Romans chapter 6 verse 6. Romans Chapter 6, verse 6. And you see the kind of prayer you ought to be praying for members of the church and the prayers that our leaders, our coordinators, our overseers, our pastors ought to be praying for members of the church. This is prayer. I told you in the introduction that some of the prayers people pray is so puny. Some of the prayers are so, they're so poor. And some of the prayers are so small and so little. Some of the prayers are so insignificant that you say, what kind of prayer is this? They're asking for arms that will suffice them just for one day. Instead of asking for the arm of the Lord that will get them through a whole lifetime. Some people are praying just for pennies. Instead of praying for the power of God that will move mountains away from our lives. As you look at the prayers that Paul the Apostle prayed for the churches, you then begin to upgrade your own prayer, increase your own prayer, improve your own prayer so that the prayers will pray, they not be puny, meaningless prayers in Jesus' name. Romans chapter 6, I'm looking at verse 6. Knowing this, that an old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth ye should not serve sin. That's the kind of prayer we ought to be praying, that now that we know that these people are born again, now that we know that these people, the old man has been crucified and the activities of the old man of the sinful nature suspended that that old man will be destroyed entirely. The Adamic nature totally gotten rid of. That's the kind of prayer we ought to be praying. We're looking at Ephesians chapter 3. Ephesians chapter 3, praying. Praying the kind of prayer that is significant. A prayer that is worthwhile. A prayer that will touch heaven. A prayer that will bring revival to the church. A prayer that will do wonders for the church of the living God. Ephesians chapter 3. I'm reading from verse 14. It says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. What's the prayer? Verse 16, that he will grant you according to the riches of, of his glory to be strengthened by might, by his spirit with might, by spirit in the inner man. That's prayer. That's prayer. He said, so that as your days are, so will your strength be. As your trials are, so will your strength be. As the temptations increase, so will your strength increase. So that you'll be strengthened in the inner man with might, by his spirit. Then he says, in verse 17, continue the prayer that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. That Christ, in all his completeness, in all his sovereignty, in all his power, may dwell in your heart. Uh, that's how to pray for the church. That you know, you are praying for the members of the church, that God will strengthen them in the inner man, 
empower them, energize them, envelope them with the power of the Spirit of God so that no Satan, no demon, no trial, no temptation, and no trouble will be able to make them backslide that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith and that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the depth and the height and to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge. That's the kind of prayer we ought to be praying that the people of God will increase in love, increase in power, increase in knowledge, increase in wisdom, increase in discernment so that it's not everybody that comes around professing to be an apostle, professing to be a prophet, to professing to be a dreamer, professing to be a preacher that they'll just fall onto. But it says that God will give them depths of understanding. Latter part of verse 19, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. That's prayer that Paul the apostle was praying for the church that's telling you that you need to examine your prayer, the prayers you pray for yourself, for your family, for the local church and for the church in general and let's look at Philippians chapter 1, Philippians chapter 1 we're looking at verse 8 it says for God is my witness how greatly I long after you all in the bowels of Jesus Christ and this I pray, that you love me about yet more and more, in knowledge and in all judgment, that means in all discernment. Uh, Paul the Apostle said, Philippians, I'm praying for you. And it's not just repeating the same thing he said to the Ephesian believers. The prayer that came by inspiration, the prayer that came by the Spirit of God interceding in his heart for them. And he's saying in verse, in verse 10, it says that she may approve the things that are excellent, that she may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. That's the kind of prayer we ought to be praying for the believers that God will help them. Now we're looking at Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. Colossians chapter 4 we're looking at verse 12. Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, salutes you, always laboring fervently for you in prayers. That's how to pray. That's how to pray. That you're praying for the believers. You're praying for the members of the church. You're praying for the members of your house fellowship, the members of your zone, the members of your district and the group. You're praying for the members of the whole church and you're praying, laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Isn't that something very good that this Epaphras was praying for the church and he wanted every member of the church, the young and the old, the men and the women, the married and the widows and the widows and everybody, that everyone will stand perfect, complete, fulfilled and fulfilling the whole totality of the will of God. Before I leave this section, I want to remind you that as Paul the Apostle prayed for the people, he also wanted them to be praying for him. Look at Romans chapter 15. Romans chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 13. Yes, the pastors will pray for members of the church. Not puny prayers, small prayers, insignificant prayers, weak prayers, prayers that have no arrow heads. No. Serious prayers, fervent prayers. But then the church too, they'll be praying for Paul. And they'll be praying for the apostle. They'll be praying for the pastors too. Let's look at Romans chapter 15. I'm reading from verse 13. It says, Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake and for the love of the Spirit that he strive together with me your prayers to God for me. You see that he said, did you see your praying is not you're in a good mood and then you're happy and then you've got all things made and everything. So that's what you're praying. No, he said, I'm asking you, I'm beseeching you, I'm pleading with you because of the Lord Jesus Christ, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake. And I'm pleading with you to pray because it says for the love of the Spirit because of the work of God and because of the Spirit of God doing the work in all these various places. That's why I want you to strive with me in your prayers to God for me. What's the prayer? What's the prayer? Look at verse 31. That I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea and that my service which I have for, for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints. You can see there how the prayer that they ought to pray ought to center on the acceptance of the word of God and of the ministry of the apostle and of the pastor and of our leaders too. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, 
2 Thessalonians. We're looking at chapter 3, and I'm looking at it from verse 1. The prayers that we pray for leadership in the church, the prayers we pray for those who are leading us in the things and the ways of the Lord. 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us. Not only pray for me, pray for us. Paul the apostle said, and he said, what are we praying for? Paul, you want us to pray for you, apostle? You want us to pray for you, pastor? You want us to pray for you? What's the prayer item or the prayer request? It says in verse 1 that the word of the Lord may have free cause and be glorified even as it is with you. He said, the church in Thessalonica, I've told you that this is a good church, this is a wonderful church, this standing church, this is a triumphant church. And he said, you know what I want you to pray? I want you to pray that everywhere I go, all the churches will be just like you. That the word of God will have free flow and free cause into their hearts, transforming their hearts, changing their lives, just like it has done for you. Look at it again, chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brethren, pray for us that the word of the Lord may have free cause and be glorified even as it is with you, and that we may be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men. He said, as we go from place to place and the doors of opportunities are opened, there are the people that do not love the gospel, they do not love salvation, they do not love what Christ has done on the cross of Calvary, and because of that, they oppose the gospel. And they oppose us. They are unreasonable and wicked men. They do not have faith. And you pray that we may be delivered from their hands. In verse 3, it says, But the Lord is faithful, who shall establish you and keep you from evil. He'll keep you from evil. And we have confidence in the Lord touching you, that ye both do and will do the things which we command you. Ephesians chapter 6. We're praying for the apostles. What are we praying for? We're praying for our leaders. What are we praying for? We're praying for the pastor. What are we praying for? Ephesians chapter 6. I'm reading there from verse from verse 8, 19. It says, and for me, and for me, and for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly and to make known the mystery of the gospel. Paul the apostle said, this is the kind of prayer I want you to pray as you are praying for the apostle, as you are praying for your overseer, as you are praying for your pastor, as you are praying for your leaders, your coordinators and group coordinators, it says, pray that all trust will be given to the preachers and then that we will open our mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. For which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. We will pray and God will answer. And when God answers, there will be revival in the church. And then many sinners will be rushing to the kingdom of God to be converted, to be born again in Jesus' name. We'll come to point number three now. We're looking at First Thessalonians chapter 3. First Thessalonians chapter 3. I'm reading verses 10 and 11. First Thessalonians chapter 3. Verses 10 and 11. Night and day praying exceedingly that we might see your face and might perfect that which is lacking in your faith. Now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. You know what he's doing here already? I, 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 told, I reminded you that in chapter 2 verse 18 he said, I wanted to come. And then, once and again, I made the effort, but Satan hindered us. Then he's now telling them, you are going to pray. But some people say, but what since Satan is hindering you to come? What are we praying about? Oh, he said, there's something greater than Satan. There's something greater than all the maneuvering and all the methods and all the manipulations of Satan. And that is God the Father. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ, his only begotten son. He says in verse 11, now God himself. He said, you talk about Satan hindering, you talk about demons hindering, you talk about enemies and people in Judea opposing the gospel. He said, God is greater than them all. And he said, Jesus Christ is greater than them all. Therefore, he said, now God himself and our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ direct our way unto you. That whether Satan likes it or not, the Lord will destroy the works of the devil. 
and he'll put Satan under our feet shortly. And if the people of God will bind themselves together in faith and in unity, and they will pray that all those hindrances of Satan, everything will be totally eradicated and blown away in Jesus' name. And so he said, as you are praying, I'm just believing that the Lord will direct our ways unto you. And he said, that's my pursuit. I'm going to, I'm coming to you so that we can perfect everything concerning you. And as you are coming to the Bible study, that's our goal. The Lord will perfect you. And everything that is imperfect in your life, in the love of God, in the mercy of God, the Lord will take everything away in Jesus' name. In Colossians chapter 1, Colossians chapter 1, this is the pursuit of ministry. This is the purpose of ministry. And this is the reason for ministry. The perfection of the saints. Colossians chapter 1 verse 28. When we preach, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom, that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. All the praying we're doing, that's the purpose. All the preaching we're doing, that's the purpose. All the programs we're holding, that's the purpose. All the traveling we're doing, that's the purpose. All the special kind of events we're having, that's the purpose. All the things we're trying to do in the church. Our leaders trying to do, they're strategizing and planning. They're holding this program, holding that program. What's the reason for that? The reason for that and the purpose and pursuit is so that we're preaching Christ and warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus, the Lord will perfect you. Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. Colossians chapter 4 verse 12. Notice the word perfect here again. Epaphras, so is one of you. A servant of Christ saluted you. Always laboring fervently for you. In prayers that we may stand perfect. That she may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. You know all the counseling we try to give. All the, Sometimes even when we make correction. All the corrections we are trying to make. And all the, you know, all the drawing we are trying to do and all the pressure we're putting all these studies and whatever it is so that the lord himself he will perfect you and make you complete in all the will of god and as we do that faithfully day to day and you are responding faithfully to you the lord will do it in your life and this church will be moving on towards perfection in jesus name we're looking at ephesians chapter 4 from verse 11 Ephesians chapter 4 verse 11 it says and he gives some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers why for the perfecting of the saints if, if he has given us a gift the gift of an apostle that is is the man now that's a gift unto you and you say Lord I'm, on, I'm not only receiving the gift of healing I'm receiving the gift of a healer I'm not only receiving the gift of deliverance I'm receiving the gift of a deliverer I'm not only receiving receiving the gift of salvation. I'm receiving the gift of the preachers of salvation. I'm not only receiving the gift of the word, I'm receiving the gift of the teacher of the word. And so the people, the leaders, the Lord has given us in the church, apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers, their gifts to the church. And the gift is for, verse 12, verse 12, for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, and for the defining of the body of Christ. Till we all come in the unity of the faith, of the, and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto what kind of man? A perfect man unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. As you look at this verse 13, are we there yet? I said, are we there yet? No, 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 no. Look at I said, do we have the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ yet? Are we perfected yet? You, you know, some people say, all oh, this preaching, we don't need preaching anymore. Of course, we need preaching. Some people say, we don't need all the prayers anymore. Of course, we need the prayer. Because it says, the ministers will keep on ministering, apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers. They'll continue until the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry, for the defining of the body of Christ. Until all that is done, the ministries of the apostles and prophets and evangelists and pastors and teachers must continue. And then it says, until we come in the unity of the faith, 
of the knowledge of the of the son of faith of the knowledge of the son of god and unto a perfect man until we come to that the preaching the praying the counseling the helping the edifying everything will continue in jesus name uh, we're looking at the word of god now in a second in second corinthians second corinthians chapter seven verse one the pursuit is perfection the reason we're preaching, that's for perfection. The reason we're praying is for perfection. And the reason we're ministering is for perfection. It says in first, Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 1, Have been there for these promises, dearly beloved. Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit, perfecting, perfecting, perfecting holiness in the fear of of God. You see what the Lord is saying that you know what the ministers are ministering, what the preachers are preaching, what the prayer warriors are praying and while the ministers are doing everything they are doing is so that we can perfect holiness in the fear of God. 2 Corinthians chapter 13 from verse 9. 2 Corinthians chapter, 9, chapter 13 verse 9 it says, for we are glad when we are weak when, ye, when we are weak and then it says, and ye are strong, and this also we wish, even your perfection. That's a desire. Even your perfection. Look at verse 11. Finally, brethren, farewell, be what? Be perfect. He said, that's why I wrote to you. All the writing we're doing, all our literature evangelism. All our ministry in the media, everything, the electronic media, everything is for your perfection. It says, want everything to moving you away from the past, farther from the past, and getting nearer and nearer and closer unto perfection. Finally, brethren, farewell, be perfect, be of good comfort, be of one mind, live in peace, and the God of love and peace shall be with you. We're looking at Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, Colossians chapter 3, and we're reading there from verse 14. Colossians chapter 3, in verse 14, it says, above And above all things, put on charity, which is the bond of perfection. It says the belt of perfection. Uh, the thing that will make all your, all your virtues complete. Your righteousness perfect. And your faith perfected. Everything you perfect is this bond or belt of perfectness. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts. To the which also ye are called in one body. And be ye thankful. And let the word of Christ dwell in you how? Richly, that's how the perfection comes. When the words of men don't hold any sway in your life. When the words of enemies don't hold any water in your life. When the words of men and the words of carnal people, backsliding people, sinful people, traditional people, when those words don't mean anything to you. And the only thing you are meditating upon is the word of Christ. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. In all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by him. It says that's how the perfection is going to come. It will come upon your life. Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5 verse 25. Ephesians 5 verse 25. Husbands, Love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it, for the church, that he might sanctify him and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. And that's how the perfection comes, the washing of the word, the cleansing by the word, the purifying by the word, and pointing out and purging us by the word of the Lord. Then it says in verse 27 that he might present it unto himself a glorious church. This church will be a glorious church. Not having spot, not having wrinkle, not having any sort of thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. The blood of Jesus will cleanse us, will purge and purify us, and then it will perfect us, and then we'll be able to offer a holy, perfect sacrifice unto the Lord in Jesus' name. You see, Paul the Apostle, his constant pursuit in his own personal life, 
His constant prayer for his own personal life that each day will see him moving closer to perfection. And his passion in ministry was also to make every each ministry opportunity lead the church towards perfection. That means every opportunity Paul had, had to preach. He said, with this message, I want to lead the church on towards perfection. Every time he had opportunity to pray, with this prayer, I want to be able to lead the church more and more unto perfection. Every time he had visitation to any assembly, he said, I want to use this area of ministry visitation to the perfection of the church. Anytime he wrote to the church, he said, I'm writing this so that the people will be perfect. And the same thing that he had in mind, that's the same thing you ought to have in mind, that every opportunity you have to preach or to pray or to minister one way or the other, you're moving the people of God unto perfection. Each message, each prayer, each deed or act of love, each exhortation or counsel, was to move his spiritual children farther away from their past and closer to perfection. He preached and prayed, he taught and travelled, he travelled and he pursued all in an effort to save and to separate the people of God from the world and to get them to cleave unto the Lord. He trusted in God's power walking effectually and effectively through his word to produce devotion well pleasing unto God in the believers he had no confidence in the flesh he had no faith in his own ability to change the hearts of men his faith was in God who has power to change sinners to saints? Who has power to change water into wine? Who has power to turn stony hearts into hearts of flesh? He had faith in this God that had power to forgive and cleanse from all unrighteousness. He was praying to the God and ministering to the power of God that will replace a depraved nature with his divine nature and to make impossibilities possible and perfect what was imperfect in the lives of the believers so that every Everyone will live lives that are pleasing unto God, and whosoever will, he can claim that, and God will do it in our lives in Jesus' name. As we look at Hebrews chapter 13, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 20 and verse 22, you can see the prayer that the man of God is praying for the church there, and praying for you, and praying for me, and praying for our church too. Hebrews chapter 13, we're looking at verse 20. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead. Our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, verse 21, make you what? As now say, make me. Start from verse 21. Make, start from make. Make me perfect in every good work to do his will. Can, can that happen? Through you it will happen. He did it for Enoch, he'll do it for you. He did it for Paul. He'll do it for you. The Lord will raise you up, not just a Christian, but an ambassador of Christ. Your way before the Lord will be perfect. Your heart will be perfect to him. And then your life, between brothers and sisters as we relate together, your life will transmit perfection to the people you see in Jesus' name. It will make you perfect in every good work to do his will. Walking in you, that which is well pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. Amen. The Lord, he has started it in you already. He will perfect what he has started. Let's rise up and talk to the Lord in prayer. The good thing the Lord has started in you. Now the Lord will continue. The Lord will fulfill. The Lord will perfect it. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No, there is nothing too hard for him. Talk to the Lord in prayer. Now the Lord, will st he has started already that work of perfection in you. He called you to himself. He will not leave you alone. He loves you. We're praising God for you. We praise God for what he has done in your life already. You are saved. I will thank God for you. I will thank God for you. You have turned away from your sin. You have turned unto the Lord. And the grace of God is working wonders in your life. You are not the person you used to be. Transformation. That's what we see. A changed life. That's what we see. We see your faith. We see your love. We see your hope. We see your steadfastness. We see your faithfulness. We see your loyalty. We're praising God for you. And you need to praise God to you for yourself. 
Look at the pit God dug you from. Look at what you were. And look at what you are now. Look at the new creation that the Lord has produced in your life. And you know this is not by your effort. This is not by your power. This is not by your knowledge. This is not by your natural ability. This is God at work in your life. And as Paul the Apostle is praising God for you, or as the leadership is praising God for you, you need to praise the Lord for yourself. You see, see if you know what I was, if you know where I was, if you know what I used to do, what I used to be, and see the change he has made in me. I'm praising God for what he has done. As you praise God for what he has done, why don't you pray for more that your love will increase? Why don't you pray for more? That your faith will become greater. Why don't you pray for more? That your hope will become more lively. Why don't you pray for more? That you'll overcome more and more. Be victorious more and more. Be a conqueror more and more. Your faith will grow. Your faith will increase. You've been faithful up to this point. Pray that God will give you more faithfulness. More earnestness more fervency, more devotion, more consecration, more yieldedness, more surrender. We thank God for what we see. We're praying for more that we're going to see. We thank God for his goodness in your life. We're praying to see more. Thank God for your family. Thank God for your children. Thank God this family is not like other families. We thank God for what we see. But we're praying for more. We're praying for more. That the grace of God in your family will increase. The light shining already that we see in your family. That that light will shine brighter. We're praying for more. The fruit of the Spirit we see already in your family. We're praising God for that. We're praising God for that. Even your neighbors can testify. You are not like the rest of them. We thank God for that, but we're praying for more. We're praying for more. Lord, increase the fruit of the Spirit in every family. We're praying for that. We thank God for this church. Thank God for the local church you belong to. Your faithfulness. Your sacrifice. We're praising God for your local church. But we're praying for more. That we'll see more and more and more of the good things we have experienced already. We're even praising God for our neighbors. We're praising God for the help they have given us, our neighbors. We're praising God for those sinners that God has kept alive. We're praising God for the way they're responding when we're preaching to them. We're praising God that more and more those sinners are listening to us. We're praising God that they're asking us, what shall we do to be saved? It wasn't like that before. We're praising God for the fact that now they're opening up. They're opening up. They're saying, come and help us. Come and help us. We need salvation. We need the gospel. We're praising God for them. Now we need to pray after we praise God for them. That God now will make them repent. That they will turn to the Lord. That they will truly repent. They will truly believe. That the Spirit of God will recreate them. Turn them to new creatures. Turn them away from darkness. Turn them to the light. May the light of the gospel to shine forth in their hearts. We're praying that God will do something new. Something new, something new in every one of their hearts. We we'll pray for the church that this church will continue to make progress. We we'll thank God for the progress revival we have seen. We we'll thank God for the level of perfection that we have seen. But we're praying for the church that will raise the perfection to a higher level. Raise our surrender a consecration, a commitment to a higher level. That the good work the Lord has started, it will continue 
it will increase, it will perfect until the whole will of God is done in every member, is done in you, is done in us, and even the world will be saying, We thank God, why eat not for that church in our community? What will our community be? You praise God, then you pray for more. Then with all the strength within you, you pursue that righteousness, that holiness, that perfection that Jesus Christ died for to impact into your life, into my life, into our lives together. That he will perfect his work in the whole church. It's a God who answers prayer with him. All things are possible. 